It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast from London. Nico Hines, world editor of The Daily Beast. How are you? All right. Uh, Pierre Aski, international affairs columnist uh, for French flagship public radio station France Inter. How are things? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Also with us, uh, uh, freelance reporter Yachun Wan. Yes. Busy week? As always. As always. Mm -hmm. Was it a busy week for documentary filmmaker Tanya Rachmanova? Yeah, it was. Yes. It was indeed. All right. Your, your latest uh, oeuvre, uh, Trump Takes on the World, which uh, yeah. was a what, three part series? Three part series. Three part yeah. series. Mm -hmm. The uh, World This Week, and by the way, you can catch the podcast version. It's always one click away in Apple Music, Spotify, and other streaming services. If only the pen were mightier than the sword. Punditry, a safe sport in the air-conditioned comfort of a Paris studio. Less so for the pair of intrepid reporters who've won the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. Russia's Dmitry Muratov, editor-in-chief of newspaper Novaya Gazeta, which has paid a heavy price for independent reporting, and uh, Maria Resser, founder in 2012 of the news website Rappler, which despite threats, intimidation, and two arrests, she continues to call out human rights abuses and hate speech under Philippines' President Rodrigo Duterte. We came out with those stories in 2016. We've been under intense attacks on social media first, weaponization of social media, then those same attacks coming from President Duterte and officials in 2018, the weaponization of the law, and then 2019, the arrest warrant, and 2020, a conviction. Yet the narrative that journalist equals criminal was seeded in 2016. Fast forward four years, and here we are. Piaski, uh, I'll ask you to put your Reporters Without Borders hat on here. Mm. We thought at one point she would be silenced, and she wasn't. No, she's she's incredible, uh, to be honest. I, I know her and we've been uh, defending her for years. Uh, she's such a, a fighter for journalism that we are so pleased that she got this uh, award today because she's so representative of the best of our profession. That means uh, someone who is defending uh, a quality journalism in face of a, a very hostile environment, both uh, the government, but also, as she mentioned in this uh, uh, quote, uh, the harassment, online harassment, as a journalist and as a woman. Uh, there was a, a very good study of, of what happened to her uh, a few months ago, uh, published by uh, a think tank, and she was uh, submitted to the most incredible harassment uh, online. So uh, really, this award is, is, is a, uh, an award for journalism and for the brave uh, persons that are defending journalism. It's interesting, Ya Chung Wang, because it's a week in which we've been looking at the, the whistleblower allegations against Facebook, and she echoes what was said on Capitol Hill. She has said that Facebook is a threat to democracy, uh, and, quote, they actually prioritize the spread of lies laced with anger and hate over facts. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. She has not only been a very outspoken activist against the current regime, and she also ab uh, accused them for using social media as abuse of power to clamp down um, opposing voices. So I think that it's, it's just as what um, uh, the previous speaker have said, that um, she has been incredibly consistent. She knew about um, Facebook's doing and the, the Filipinos, they have been speaking out against uh, online abuses, hate speech in the Philippines using social media, and she has been a leading figure in it, and she has been relentless. It's absolutely incredible what she has been doing. Tanya Rachmanova, uh, in previous years, sometimes the Nobel Peace Prize comes and it's hit and miss. What were your thoughts when you heard this announcement that it was these two? Oh, I was, I mean, I was amazed and happy and, uh, well, yeah, surprised because... I mean, I think for one, this year, I mean, it's a real Nobel Prize for peace. And for the journalists, as in so many countries in the world, it, they are the main target today. And for Muratov, whom I met several times, I mean, he's a, quite an incredible person. And nobody expected him to get the prize. And everybody's very happy because he, he would never put himself over it. He would never say, I am anything. He was just, he is a perfect rock protector of journalism. 
And uh, the other thing is that yesterday it was 15 years since the assassination of Anna Politkovska. Who wrote for Novaya Gazeta yeah, newspaper. Yeah, who was his main journalist and whom he was protecting all these years. And as 15 years means that the, the prosecution has ended, the investigation is put to the end. That was it's kind of a prize for all of them and yeah. a huge encouragement. Nick, Nico Hines, writing in the Daily Beast, you point out exactly that. Uh, Moratov earns the prize exactly one day after that 15th anniversary uh, of Politovskaya. She had fearlessly called out human rights abuses in Chechnya. Uh, and uh, you, you wrote uh, in your piece that uh, the uh, 15 years marks the end of that statute of limitation. Uh, we now know, although we already had long guessed, that the men who ordered Politovskaya to be silenced on Putin's birthday will never be held to account. That's right. And I think, you know, <clears throat> it's obviously not the same as justice, but I do think the Nobel Committee have done something that they don't usually do, and they've really um, put themselves out there and made a quite aggressive statement today. You know, this is a real slap in the face for Putin. Um, and, of course, that's not the same as as holding the killers um, to, to account properly. Um, but I do think it's a really important step, and it's a, it's a, it's a welcome um, sign that the Nobel Committee is saying loudly here on the world stage that, you know, people standing up to Putin are fighters. And, you know, you've got to remember that Vladimir Putin, although he'll try and shrug this off, I'm sure, desperately wanted to win that Nobel Peace Prize. I know it sounds silly, but he actually thought he had a chance and the Kremlin's been fighting for it. And every year someone seems to nominate him for it. Um, so this really will be a painful blow to him. Yeah, painful for him. And if you can't beat him, join him. Dateline the Kremlin. Let's listen to the reaction to the Nobel Peace Prize from spokesperson Dmitry Peskov. We can congratulate Dmitry Muratov. He has constantly worked in accordance with his principles and has adhered to his ideals. He's talented and brave. It's a high appraisal and we congratulate him. Piaski. Hypocrisy. Um, there's no other word. I mean, this is this comes from a government that has suppressed uh, large uh, 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 pieces of press freedom in in Russia, and and. Uh, or, or can you argue that Novaya Gazeta is useful for the for the for the powers that be, saying, "Look, you you accuse us of being uh, autocrats here. We we still let this." Yes, it's paper the the only there. remaining uh, pillar of press freedom uh, with uh, its own limitations. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think there's no doubt for everybody in the world that this prize is an encouragement for those who are defending real press freedom, uh, wherever uh, they are in the world. And, and it's a, a good timing because press freedom has been on the, uh, on the defensive for years, you know. Uh, countries like the Philippines or Russia, for that matter, are countries where there was more press freedom five or ten years ago than there is today. And this happens in many parts of the world. And I think this price is really an encouragement for those who are fighting for those uh, values uh, in, in this, uh, um, well, dangerous world. And you heard uh, a moment ago Tanya Rachmanova saying how uh, Dmitry Morotov uh, is brutally honest. Well, he pulled no punches when he came out to greet that media scrum outside the Moscow offices of Novaya Gazeta earlier. If I were on the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, I would have voted for the person that the bookmakers were counting on. But I think that person has everything ahead of him. I am referring to Alexei Navalny. Mm. <laughs> is that a joke or is he serious when he says that? I think that he's rather serious and I, <clears throat> I'm looking forward for his noble speech because I think he will mention Navalny. But what's interesting about Peskov and the head of the chief of your, you know, uh, Russia Today um, channel, 
uh, Peskov do- didn't mention Novaya Gazeta. So he, they reduced it. This is their political line, well, line today. They reduced it to him personally, that he held this prize personally. He is such a nice person. They don't refer to the newspaper, six uh, journalists uh, on this newspaper who died for doing the investigations. And uh, Simonyan, who is the head of Russia today, she said, oh, yes, because he is so good. He is doing all this charitable work with children. So is, is it a bit it's like... Very, interesting how they move it. Because we saw in the Philippines a lot of positive reaction, even from from quarters you wouldn't expect. Is it kind of like, well, a Nobel Prize for our country, so it's kind of like a gold medal? Is it? Well, I don't, I mean, I, I, I think that my, my, well, the, my friends call it the journalists, they take it as a golden prize and a huge encouragement, as Pierre said, but not the officials. You know, yesterday I was in Bayeux in Western France, uh, where there is a memorial for all the dead journalists in in action. And yesterday, we added 53 new names in the past year, people who died in in the exercise of journalism. So we're we're not talking of of, uh, a joke. We're talking of people who are putting their life uh, on on the line. And and this price is really coming as as an encouragement for those people. And, And whatever the attempts to diminish the impact or, or to recuperate, I don't know how you say that, uh, to, to, to get it politically uh, on the side of any government, this is an encouragement for independent journalism and not for any government or a government-sponsored uh, media. All right, speaking of reporters doing their job, eight months of pouring over the largest whistleblower data dump ever begetting the Pandora Papers. Fresh tales of how the high and mighty stash their cash far from the tax man. Everyone from the King of Jordan and the President of Kenya to uh, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. A lot of it legal, a lot of it morally dubious. The Russian president himself is not directly named, but it turns out that a close friend, often dubbed Putin's cleaning lady, moved a lot of money. A Monaco luxury apartment bought in Svetlana Krivonogik's name back in 2000. And uh, three, this is a tale rife with Panama-based offshore companies and British Virgin Island uh, banks. Uh, Nico Hines, is this, well, it's been five years since the Panama Papers. Is, how do you feel the public is reacting to it where you are? I don't think the public gets too exercised about the details of this, but I think what makes it a really important story is that it ensures that these figures can't use these kind of systems in the future because they know that they're now at risk of being exposed. So, I mean, I'm not saying that they're all going to suddenly become virtuous and and stop stealing money from their various states, but they'll have to work harder at concealing the money. So that in itself is a win. I do think it's very interesting if you look at the way it's played out differently in different countries. So, Um, In the Czech Republic and in Holland, there's been ramifications for people who've been implicated because the press has been really hounding them. Whereas if you look in Russia and Kenya, um, the media has kind of made made out that there's not really a story here. Um, So I think as we go back, looking back to that press freedom issue, I think that is really important as to how this is presented to people. And even though it's illegal, do we think it's right that this is what the people in power are doing? They've got these huge sums of money and they don't want us to know what they're doing with it. Ya Chong Wang? Well, one other thing that I think a lot of people might put a doubles finger on this is also that there's no American name uh, in this massive document leak. And uh, it is true that it has caused a massive response because it's also one of the very first leak that has named I think 330 or so uh, politicians, and these are the people that are making these laws happening. Um, even though it is not as explosive, uh, explosive as the Panama Paper five years ago, but I think it is uh, just like what uh, Nicole is saying that it is pointing finger at these lawmakers that you are you're not able to run away from these laws that you are creating. Um, however. It is interesting to see that how that there is no mentions of American names. But the United States, current. the United States is called out. It's called out because of the fact that you have so many of these places, like uh, the state of South Dakota, like uh, even now Florida, uh, which which are tax havens, and and there's no reciprocity in terms of 
finding out about those names in the U.S. Exactly, and then that is what's the interesting part because uh, we don't know much about the source of the leak at the moment, but we do know that there are these sources that leak to them. So what are the relationships? Is, is there more, actually, that will come out in relations uh, to what's being released in the Pandora paper? That's something that I think could be very interesting, especially uh, for, let's say, the month or the next P starting uh, papers to come out and see. Again, it's a question of, uh, a lot of this is legal. You know, uh, Tony Blair and his wife, uh, when they purchase uh, real estate in the heart of London through a shell company, that's legal. Uh, I don't, it doesn't say that uh, what was done by uh, uh, close confidants of Vladimir Putin was illegal. It just shows the circuit of the money. Exactly. And uh, also, you know, um, the question, uh, is it legal, the act itself? Of of course, it could be legal, like, uh, you know, this cleaning lady or there was this musician who got, by the way, awarded uh, last week, the friend of a uh, friend of um, uh, Putin. But, uh, you know, uh, still for the public opinion, this is a big thing. Uh, I mean, probably less in Russia, these Pandora papers, because there was this Navalny's investigations who were the first to uncover uh, this uh, you know, this money laundering and money disappearing. But still, I think the most important is this. And there is this pressure that's growing. This Friday, the OECD announcing a major breakthrough in the push to reform global taxation and force multinationals to pay where they do business, not where they plant their corporate headquarters. 137 out of 140 nations signing up ahead of an important G20 summit. Even the likes of Ireland have agreed to raise their minimum corporate tax rate to 15%. It is a sensible and a pragmatic decision made by the government in the interests of our country and ultimately a decision that I believe will be critical to conditions to create longer term certainty for businesses and investors. But as usual, the devil's in the detail. The Irish winning concessions, one of those concessions allowing multinationals to keep pruning their Irish tax bill by tapping write-offs that incentivize research and development spending, reports uh, Politico. The loopholes are still there, Pierre Aski, and, you know, voters get outraged about uh, they have to pay their taxes and the rich, high and mighty don't. And even when you go back, even when the Irish agree to move up to 15%, mm. there's this sense that, those corporations won't be paying much tax. You're saying uh, voters are outraged. I, I think they are not outraged enough. And that's the problem, is that, uh, you know, we've had the Panama Papers, the uh, LuxLeaks about Luxembourg, and now the Pandora Papers, and all these revelations about uh, tax evasion and so on. And, and, and people get away with it. Uh, and even if they use legal ways, they are not moral ways. And, you know, we're going to have a test in, uh, this weekend with the, the elections in the Czech Republic. And the prime minister is named in the Pandora Papers. And, and it's been reported in the Czech Republic. And he's a favorite of the election. So if he gets away with it, then why should he stop, you know? Uh, and that's where I think there is uh, something that was broken in our societies in, in the past maybe decade, is that... The, the, the moral outrage has, has, has shifted. And when, when you are in this populist wave, you, you know, it's like with Trump, you know, Trump could say the most outrageous things and his followers were still following him. And you have the same with this question of money. Uh, if you follow the leader, uh, he, you know, it's normal that he makes money and that he, he puts it on the side. And, and I think there's something broken there morally about our societies. All right, much more to talk about when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching The World This Week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. The Daily Beast world editor, Nico Hines, is with us from London. Uh, Pierre Aski, international affairs columnist at uh, French public radio station France Inter. Freelance reporter Ya Chun Wang is with us too. And so is documentary filmmaker Tanya Rachmanova. How serious can it get between China on the one hand, Taiwan and its allies on the other? A record number of flyovers over 
Taiwanese airspace by China in the past week. This following military maneuvers, uh, the tension seemed to be easing in the last couple of days. Now that a Wall Street Journal report has uh, brought out into the open the special ops training the Taiwanese military by the U.S., it's anyone's guess what uh, the next days and weeks have in store. Ya Chun Wang is, I know that, you know, the, the, the tensions in the South China Sea are always there. There's always flyovers. How bad is it this time? If you ask me how bad, um, it, it really it really depends on where you see it, because I see many reasons why China is flying this many private jets for the very first time. Three days in a row uh, from their national day, October 1st, October 2nd, October 4th. This is definitely unprecedented. But there are several reasons I can think of why they're doing this. First, national military parade, as always. Second, Xi Jinping is facing a lot of trouble domestically speaking. Um, uh, power out, power outage, uh, lowering economic uh, GDP uh, growth, um, many other things happening. And I think there's another reason also that not only he's trying to find uh, an achievement, an immediate achievement for the domestic people to have more trust in him during the next election, even though we all know the elections. But is this just saber rattling then? I would say less so, less so than before, but I'm still not certain. This is the million dollar question. Is he, is China going to uh, put forward military actions or not? This is a question that scholars um, are trying to figure out. Um, however, I do think that not in recent years, because first of all, deployment, military deployment towards Taiwan, it takes it does take years to prepare. And then now that China actually have to consider America, UK, uh, Japan, Australia, all of these forces actually all together um, attacking this one source because it's ha it has been calling for these allies for Taiwan in a way by posing all these military threats. This report that uh, special ops, U.S. special ops are training the Taiwanese military, is that just kind of an open secret, Pierre Husky, or... Does this raise the tension another notch? It is uh, raising uh, the escalation because, uh, you know, there's, there's this uh, uh, one China policy where the U.S. has recognized Beijing uh, and, and dropped its recognition of, of Taiwan, but it's still protecting Taiwan. Uh, but having a military presence is unprecedented uh, uh, since 1979, since the, the breakup of relations between the U.S. and Taiwan. So th this is a serious matter, but I think it goes with the escal escalation on the other side. Uh, I think the leak of that information was, was deliberate to, to, to show uh, that the, the U.S. Is, is ready to defend Taiwan. Uh, what is at stake here is not so much whether China is going to attack uh, Taiwan is whether China will succeed in having Taiwan fall like a ripe fruit. Uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese are adepts of Sun Tzu, the, the uh, military theorist who said that the best battles are those who are won without fighting them. That means they want Taiwan to fall uh, without having to fight for it. And for that, they try to isolate Taiwan to show uh, its uh, allies, that it's not worth fighting for it. Uh, you know, there's a, a delegation of French senators who are in, in Taipei at the moment. The amount of pressure that has come from the Chinese embassy in Paris to try to discourage this delegation, you know, these are, are French senators. I mean, yeah, let, let, it, let's, it, let's talk nothing. about that. It's let's, nothing. Let's <laughs> talk about that. It's like a red rag to a bull, this visit to Taipei of a delegation of lawmakers. And we could show you images of uh, Senator Alain Richard. He's a former defense minister from the 1990s, awarded a medal uh, by Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. Beijing responding in kind. People like Alain Richard lack the basic respect and recognition of norms governing international relations. If not so, then they were kidnapping state-to-state -state relations out of self-interest. China strongly condemns and firmly rejects that. France should earnestly abide by the One China Principle and not send any wrong signals to the Taiwan Independence Force. Yeah, and Pierre Aski, uh, 
besides politics junkies like you and me, who else remembers that Anna Richard was once the defense minister in France? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. And that's where, that's where uh, it's interesting because they want to cut every single link, including the, the weakest one. You know, having a connection between the French Senate and Taiwan is, is irrelevant to the overall conflict in East Asia. Uh, and nevertheless, you have the spokesman of the foreign ministry devoting a whole section of his briefing uh, to condemn this as, as if it was some major uh, breach of, of the status quo. You know, and that's really the sign that they want to isolate Taiwan as much as possible because they don't want to face a military assault because a military assault would be a, a gamble for, for China. Uh, if, if the U.S. come to the rescue of Taiwan, uh, it can escalate you know, between two nuclear powers. But, but the news of this, uh, from, the, from, from the, this Wall Street Journal report, that there's special ops there, it's, it's the opposite, that the, the, the international community is getting more stuck in there, it seems. You know, after the fall of Kabul, uh, there was some speculation that the U.S. is, is, uh, is weak, the U.S. has no strategy, the U.S. is, is getting back inwards. And, and what uh, uh, Biden has tried to show in the past few weeks, first of all, with the alliance with the UK and uh, Australia, AUKUS, and now with this announcement, is that, OK, we've left uh, Afghanistan on a defeat, but because we are focusing on China. And, and focusing on China means defending Taiwan. So uh, there, there is a lot of psychological warfare there. N Nico Heinz, do people underestimate Washington's resolve? Well, I think people underestimate um, Xi Jinping's willingness and desire to actually reunite China. You know, he's the most powerful Chinese leader since Chairman Mao, and I've got no doubt that he's utterly, um, utterly determined to complete the communist re revolution and to unite China under one party. And I think... I think a lot of the um, foreign policy kind of community and pundits are actually underestimating the chance that there will be some sort of real conflict here, whether it's a direct armed struggle or not. And I think if you look at the US carefully, they agree with me because they have been, you know, the fact that they've got people there um, training the special forces is, as you say, an escalation. I think the AUKUS deal is a huge indication as well that the US was willing to blow up this huge deal and make this massive fight with France because they are so keen that Australia has these nuclear powered subs in the region and that there really is a strong united force in case something actually does go down um, in Taiwan. Yeah, and we, we, we all got the jitters this Friday when we heard about a US submarine, Nico, that uh, uh, had some been damaged or a few, a few, few of the sailors on board uh, injured. It's now safely back at dock in, uh, in Guam. We don't know what happens, but uh, it, it's getting tense. Yeah, and with these things, there are always little skirmishes that come before major conflicts. Um, and look, we're talking about a relatively long scale here. I think, the, I think the most crucial thing, actually, if you look at this, is the China census data, which came out earlier this year, and shows that we might actually be nearing the peak of China's powers. And so, and when I say nearing, I'm talking about in the 2030s, early 2040s, perhaps. So... On a relatively small time scale, if China wants to reunite its nation, it's going to have to move quite fast. So something could be on the horizon, I think, in the next 10 years. Tanya Rachmanova, you, were, you um, investigated how Trump dealt uh, with yeah. uh, that, that part of the world. Are you surprised to see the Biden administration staying the course? Yes, and the whole, our team, we are rather surprised because probably we put too much hope in Biden thinking that it will be so different, everything will be different and they know how to deal it, even though we were told that <clears throat> he's not listening to the advisors. Uh, but on China, of all what we learned on China, what I'm doing now, you know, the history of China, I totally agree that Xi Jinping needs this. He needs a big thing to, first of all, and I know it from my country of origins, and probably the communist past, you know, you can unite people against an enemy or for a big purpose, which is, it's better not, it's not to be economy because that's complicated. 
So Taiwan is a great purpose for them. They are not in a hurry. Yes, we are speaking about this week, next week, but they are not in weeks, they are in years. So now they will test how far the West could go. And then they will, and then the Taiwan is a democracy, so they will work on the Taiwanese people. And uh, step by step, I think uh, they will, well, I don't know, I mean, but they, they are doing, I think that they have a very well thought politics. And I remember the last line in our Trump series, we were interviewing a Chinese as somebody, the advice of the president, he said that the America thinks that they are the most important country. We think that China is. So we will have conflicts. So what? Yeah, Chong Wong, again, I ask you the question we asked at the outset, which is, are, is this any different? When you hear Piaski talking about uh, China's strategy of putting the squeeze uh, on Taiwan, does Taiwan feel it? Yes, definitely. I think you can see from the reaction this time from Tsai Ing-wen and also our defense minister, they are definitely sending a signal to the international people. I mean, we are a small island. We know that if we don't yell, if we don't cry, people are just going to overlook this. Look at how many things have already happened in this Friday. Taiwan has to yell and cry for its own rights, for its own democracy, that it sees sinking um, under this humongous pressure coming from China. Um, and again, I think the international actors, they, they sort of understand where the pressure is coming from and that China for the t uh, 2035 plan, it is, it is looming. I know that after, I think after the year of COVID, we have realized that year passed by so quickly and China, I think it is definitely preparing. It's not, it doesn't, it fights a battle, but it doesn't fight a battle that it will lose. So it's waiting for the U.S. to have a milder response. Um, I think also after Kabul, um, it is testing the U.S. response. Does the U.S. still want to be the world police or it is losing its, uh, its title in a way? But it doesn't sound like it's leaving it. Exactly. And I think that's what China wanted to make, uh, sort of wanted to make sense for itself. Test, test, the, exactly. test the waters. Pierre Aski, there's, a, there's that party congress next year in China, mm -hmm. after which Xi Jinping will become the longest serving leader since Mao. Does it all calm down after that? No, because there's a deadline. The deadline is, is 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic. And by that time, China thinks that it has to reunite the whole Chinese family, which includes Taiwan. But also, in the next few years, the balance of power will be uh, shifting slowly in favor of, of China, because China is putting lots of energy and a lot of money into its army. You know, I went first the first time in, in Taiwan in 1999, uh, more than 20 years ago, and the balance of power was in favor of Taiwan at that time. The economy was, uh, was stronger, the army was still stronger. Today it's exactly the opposite. China's army is, uh, is the second army in the world after the one of the US. The economy is the second one in the world after the US. And, and Taiwan knows that it cannot defend itself alone. And, and that's what's at stake at the moment. Uh, one final question on this. Nico Hines, uh, you heard Ya Chun Wang saying that for the time being, uh, the U.S. isn't blinking. The United Kingdom, does it have the stomach for this fight? <laughs> no, I don't think so, no. Um, I think Britain will always follow along and do whatever the US does. And I think um, it has been really startling, um, even before the Kabul um, incident, that Joe Biden, I mean, I think even, in fact, when he was running for the um, for the nomination for the Democrats, let alone running for the presidency, he was already talking about China, really focusing on China, making China the new focus um, of American domestic political life. And I think he is planning, I mean, he maybe he won't be around for that much longer himself, but I think he is trying to set the US up for a, another, you know, long battle against a foe on the other side of the world, and this time it's going to be China. All right, another Cold War, perhaps. And uh, now, uh, before we go, uh, we have seen a big reckoning in many countries, Australia, the United States, just to name two. France has turned to face the past of its Catholic Church. After a steady drip of sex abuse scandals here, the independent Sauvé Commission, piecing together evidence and testimony over two years and chronicling seven decades of abuse. Its findings, a bombshell. Jean-Marc Sauvé, who described the sheer numbers to France 24's uh, Mark Perlman, puts it in perspective, saying that uh, this is part 
of uh, a wider preying on uh, adolescents. En France, nous prenons conscience. In France, we acknowledge the huge number of minors who have been sexually abused before turning 18. Donc avant l'âge de 18 ans, des personnes qui ont été Five and a half million people. This means that more than 10% of the adult population of France has been subjected to sexual abuse before the age of 18. De tels abus avant l'âge de 18 ans. So five and a half million people nationally, that perhaps puts into perspective, but the numbers were still shocking uh, because it was 200,000 uh, from the church itself and then 300,000 if you add to it things like Boy Scout uh, counselors and, and the likes, uh, Pierre Aski. And those numbers, three times bigger than the previous estimate and s the Soviet Commission stressing that this is a conservative estimate. Mm. It, it was shocking for, for French people and uh, in a double way, first of all, the figure. And secondly, you know, France is a secular country. The influence of the church is, is very weak uh, uh, nowadays. And most people don't understand why the church is not uh, reforming itself on, on those issues and is still uh, taking a very conservative approach. For example, we had the head of the Catholic bishops in France saying the, the secrecy of a confession is more important than the laws of the Republic. And, and that's something yeah, that, that, that you know, a, a vast majority of French people don't understand. And, and, and if that had been said by a Muslim leader, there would be an outrage, you know, and the state would have said, uh, this is sedition, this is... Uh, uh, and, and so there is a misunderstanding between the church and the Republic at this stage in, in history. And, and, and how can a bishop defend secrecy when, when secrecy has produced this uh, huge scandal? Yeah, let's listen to the words of uh, Archbishop of Reims, Éric Moulins Bonfort. He's been summoned by the Interior Minister for saying this. Confession must remain secret because it provides a free space of expression. So is the confidentiality of the confessional above the laws of the Republic? Maintaining the secrecy of confession is mandatory. Above the law. In that sense, it's above the law. Of course, we have criminal laws in France, Tanya Rachmanova. If you are, if you cover up acts of pedophilia or sex abuse, uh, you, you can be criminally charged. So well, that's, uh, it's yeah. like we're back to, an, to, to, the, to the old argument in France between uh, the, 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 the secular state and the church. Yeah, well, I think that there is a crisis, there is something very deep crisis of misunderstanding because on one side you have this 300,000 people who uh, confessed to us, I mean, who recognized that they were <coughs> abused, which I think if uh, the same commission was uh, set up like 50 years ago, it wouldn't be the case. The people would keep it like private and wouldn't go against the church. They said and that people started to open up in 2015. Exactly. That's yeah. just a few years ago. Yeah, but, but at least they started opening, but not the church. So there is a, you know, there is a kind of a big difference between the the, the believers, I would say Catholics, because they are Catholics, they, the people who went to church, who went to the boys, and the church. And I think they have, well, they have a huge lesson. There is a huge lesson in if they don't change. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I can hardly imagine their future. And the Soviet Commission was outspoken, uh, Ya Chun Wang, saying they need to review um, the rules of celibacy, which for them are part of the problem. Absolutely. And just to sort of bring back what Pierre had brought up, if this was not the Catholic Church, but let's say uh, from the leader of the Muslim community in France, this would have caused a much, much more outrage, probably several protests that caused bleeding and everything. However, the, the French state, I think they are stuck. They don't really know how to deal with this, which is an absurd reality that really the French society need to deeply, deeply reflect on. How could something so grotesque, so un inhumane that is happening uh, in the religious sector that supposedly in France shouldn't have existed, uh, how, how come this ex explosion does not shake their heart? However, if this were to happen in a non predominantly white religious community, this would have caused national security law to pass that it just happened in 2019, for example. Uh, Nico Heinz, uh, the, the, the archbishop we heard, he's the head of the bishop's council in France. 
I, I do find the um, <clears throat> the psychology of the way these things are covered up to be fascinating within institutions. Um, we were talking about the UN, I think, last week or the week before, and um, some sort of similar-ish kind of um, circumstances in Africa, and and the way that when these things are reported, the first instinct is to cover cover everyone, cover cover yourself, cover, make sure this doesn't get out because we'll be we'll look terrible. I, I and I do think that churches. Um, provide a unique problem because um, the people who um, who dedicated their lives to these institutions, unlike a company or even something like the UN, they genuinely believe the church is the most important thing on earth and they'll do anything to protect the reputation of the church. So I do think that the problem is particularly acute um, within religions for that reason. But I think what's going to change, and I think, you know, you talked about from 2015, pe more people coming forward. I think what's going to happen differently from now on is that people who have suffered at the hands of these monsters are no longer going to keep quiet. They might when they're little kids, but within a couple of years, they're going to come out and they're going to say, hey, this is this happened, this is not right, we need to do something about it. So I do think there's some hope that the, uh, the old school kind of uh, purveyors of these things won't be able to keep it quiet for too much longer. Mm. We'll leave it there for now. I want to thank you, Nico Hines, for joining us uh, from London. I want to thank as well Tanya Rachmanova, Yachon Wang, Pierre Aski, thank you for being with us here. Much more on our website, france24.com. Thanks for being with us here in The World This Week.